Welcome to uh, the second lecture for the Seminar of Neural Network Architectures at the Towards AI Discord server. Uh, today we are going to see some uh, popular network architectures. They are uh, um, architectures that uh, you can use on your work uh, right away and they are uh, proved to be quite useful. The, So we are going to see multitask learning, CMEs networks, uh, generative adversarial networks, also known as GANs, and uh, uh, and disentangled representation learning. And then we are going to talk a little bit about style transfer and see the, the initial uh, neural style transfer paper uh, that is not necessarily that uh, related to, to disentangled representation learning as such, but uh, we are going to discuss bit more about it uh, to bridge it for uh, next lecture. All right, so regarding to multitask learning. Uh, multitask learning uh, in this uh, journal article in 97 by uh, Rich Car Caruana um, is uh, it's quite interesting because people normally cite that uh, paper as say, well, this is what we're doing, you know, learning but uh, if you read the paper that paper was uh, already uh, a, a very established concept and field by the time that paper got published yeah uh, so so multitask learning has a very long history in, in neural nets and, and, and machine learning in, in general yeah um, and uh, it, but the, the article talks is, is more about whether it makes sense to the multitask learning or not and, 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 and what is the, the situation. So, yeah. uh, what is the advantage of, of, of multitask learning or when, when we want to use it is when we want to use other tasks over the same data to give uh, the, the network a, a, an in, inductive bias. Yes. So uh, that... Uh, but what we want is to be able to uh, to use certain ideas and intuitions we have about the data and, and make sure that uh, the network is aware of, of, uh, of this behavior that the data should have. For example, if, if we know uh, our data has, um, for example, wind data, yes, and, and, and but in this particular region where we are trying to, to build our model, the wind usually uh, blows in, in a north-south direction, yeah? So then we, we want the network to, to be aware of this type of inductive bias that, that wind data in, in, in this uh, setting should have uh, that type of, uh, of bias, of, of, of uh, north-south uh, bias, yeah? And uh, how to in incorporate this type of inductive bias? One idea is then to um, use multitask learning, and then I'll explain you shortly how to go about it. But the overall concept of multitask learning is, is very straightforward. Um, if you are doing neural nets, you have an input, input here uh, at, at the bottom of the of the slide. Yeah, the network executes and produces an output like task one. Uh, but from the same uh, uh, Train network, we can also train a second output, task two. <coughs> Excuse me. So, given uh, this, uh, if we have all these tasks we want to do over the same inputs, we could uh, train uh, four different networks. And that's what normally people do. Um, in some situations, yes, when um, we do need uh, to execute things uh, more. Um, resource constraint, for example, in a cell phone, or, or, or um, speed is an issue. Instead of training four different networks, then we will try to train only one network and have this uh, output layer read out the four different tasks. Uh, what multitask learning refers is, is, is not to that process from a perspective of um, in um, this is, um, efficiency, but it realizes that by training task one, 
the network is um, is incorporating an, an inductive bias even when doing a train task two. Yes, um, and we can see that because as you are training the network, you have um, these uh, gradients coming from task one that are modifying the parameters. Yeah, and then. Uh, they have this gradient coming from task 2 also modifying the parameters. So there is this interference between these different tasks that uh, get the, the networks to, uh, to share this parameter space. And um, the, the way people use multitask learning uh, these days is to, uh, in a way, incorporate features to, to, to the system. If we have a particular feature that we believe is useful, then we uh, we ask the system to predict that feature, which is not useful as an output because we already have that feature, but uh, we believe that uh, because that feature should help, then that inductive bias, that type of bias and bias in the weights towards that feature is something that um, should be useful. And uh, I have done that on, on my own work. Um, in a paper I published in 2019, um, and there with by my co-author, we were looking at trying to predict uh, whether uh, uh, a rationale for a trade uh, in, in, in an educational system, uh, a financial educational system, was um, uh, a well thought out rationale or not. Yeah. We have a certain architecture there, and then we were trying to predict this uh, thought uh, feature, whether it was thoughtful or not. Yeah. How, but we believe that whether it was a, a sell or a buy type of trade, or whether it was a stock or, or a mutual fund type of trade, that, in part, that that should help tell whether the rationale was thoughtful or not. And therefore, we incorporate these two items that we already knew beforehand as output for the network, and ask the network to predict it from, from there. Uh, in the particular experience of that paper, that didn't work. And if um, you go back to this, this begs the question about, well, uh, what happened with loss function, right? I mean, you have a loss function for task one and a loss function for task, task two. If you are combining all these uh, gradients upgrade, updates, how do you go about it? Yeah. Uh, the obvious thing is just to take the average of, of, of these uh, updates. So at the same time I was publishing this paper in, in, in uh, Macau, uh, this uh, paper came about uh, compa comparing different methods to um, update the, the, the lost uh, functions in, in multitask learning. And it turns out that um, same thing that, that I observed in, in a particular example on, on, on my paper. Just combining them by hand um, in a straightforward manner doesn't really work well. Yes. Why? It's because um, as you are updating the weights, one of the loss, one of the tasks, one of the loss functions may be going through a plateau. Yes. So in, in there, it doesn't really matter so much in which direction the weights get changed. Yes, because it's, it's moving very slowly through through there. However, it's still pushing the weights away from, from updates that will benefit the second task. Therefore, uh, what they propose is this uh, technique called dynamic weight averaging, where they compute the gradient separately for each loss function, and then detect the, the loss change ratio. They see which different um, loss function is changing more rapidly than the others, and then compute logits uh, using softmax to say, well, we want to allocate a stronger updates to the loss function that is changing more rapidly. And using this combination that changes dynamically what the network is trained, they obtain a, a, a much uh, successful um, multitask learning. So here you have an architectural decision regarding uh, how you express your system and how you uh, set up the, the outputs. And this goes together with a training regime and a particular way of uh, intermixing the loss functions to, to take it to completion. So using this, um, the, the multitask learning seems uh, a much uh, 
valid uh, te technique. All right, so now uh, we go to uh, CME's uh, networks, yes? Um, CME's networks uh, is uh, it's a popular topic, yeah, you may have heard about them before. One of the interesting things uh, from uh, preparing these lectures is that uh, it allowed me to go back to the source. So even though I have used CME's networks in the past in my work, I never had the time to read this origi the original paper that described them. And um, if, if you are going to take something away from these uh, courses, uh, please go read this paper. It's from 30 years ago. Uh, it has four authors. The first two are, 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 are uh, female research scientists. Um, the second one in particular, I'm really fan of, of her work in, in feature engineering in, in particular. And I have the, the pleasure to, to meet the, the researcher a few years back in a, a New Rips uh, workshop. So, this paper is a, it's a very interesting combination of uh, hand-crafted uh, feature engineering and neural networks uh, working in, um, with the limited data and processing power of, of, of the 90s. And um, what they are doing is uh, they are training a similarity metric. So they have two inputs and they are trying to see whether they are similar or not. And, and to do that, they transform the inputs into uh, a, an entangle, a distributed representation, yeah? uh, as, uh, an array of, of, of uh, numbers that allows you to just do a simple uh, dot product to tell whether they are similar or not. So let's take a look at this. And uh, the specific problem they are working on is to um, detect whether two signatures are the same, yeah? So they have a, a particular piece of hardware that is uh, um, <clears throat> they have a, a particular piece of hardware that uh, they have a particular piece of hardware that is uh, recording all this uh, information, not only about the position of the pen, but also the speed that the pen is moving uh, through the, um, the space. And um, they, um, they then um, transform that into uh, very, very handcraft uh, features of uh, pressure and speed and location that make this input. There are 200 different neural networks that capture eight different features at, at different uh, moments in time. All these normalize, so, so a longer signatures have the same number of features as the shortest signatures. That happens in a preprocessing module. And from there, they go to um, uh, two layers of, of neurons, uh, I mean, uh, one layer of neurons, to get to an output layer that uh, has uh, 80 bits in total, yeah, such that um, there's two layers and the output layer has a 80 bits in total, which is small enough that it fits into the magnetic uh, strip of, of a credit card of the 90s. Yeah, so people can carry around their, all the details of their signature inside their own credit card. And um, these two um, networks, the, the one on the left and on the right, are actually the same, um, have the same weights, yeah? Which is something we discussed in the first lecture, is, is the idea that the weight updates happen simultaneously on um, both matrices, which give you a, a conceptual idea that the, the weights are shared between the two networks. Um, and what they do then is, is, is compress post-process all these uh, 1,600 uh, values on the input layer to these uh, 80 numbers at the end, which are get uh, then uh, multiplied to get this distance metric. And uh, what, they, what they do is they take this sliding window over the um, uh, input layer and uh, start um, uh, 
and compute weights that allow you to generate um, um, values in, in, in the next layer. So, so it's similar in a way to um, uh, convolutional network where we're going to see in class uh, in the fifth uh, lecture. But in this case, the, the particular values on the, on, on the, the kernel of, of the CNN are, are changed in each position. So, so in that sense, it's, it's more like a, 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 window, a window way of, of building the architecture more than a, an actual CNN. Uh, the beauty of, of, of this um, system is that it can be trained directly because the, the dot product is uh, differentiable. So uh, we can get a gradient from this, from training data. And uh, that's, uh, uh, a, a big, uh, a big, big value uh, from, from this architecture. Yep. So each network in the CME is produced then an encoding of its input. Yeah. And the encoding vector is the activation at the last layer. So for two different inputs, the encoding vectors are compared by cosine of angle between them. So it's a dot product uh, be divided by the norm. In practice, just using the dot product alone is enough because uh, if we use the dot product, then the network is forced to just uh, produce normalized uh, encoding vectors. Yeah, the system is trained end to end by feeding pairs of inputs and the target similarity value. So you can set that um, 1.0 means that the two inputs are, are similar, and minus 1, they are dissimilar, or, or you can use 0 or, or 1. Yeah. And, and this really hinges uh, in, in two facts, the fact that you have the shared weight between the two networks, and that that product is differentiable, so that propagation can be applied. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about generative adversarial networks. Uh, as you can see, the, the original paper for generative adversarial network has received 54,000 citations according to Google Scholar. It's really, um, in the 2010s, uh, was a very intense period of, of research on, on the topic. Uh, by now, um, uh, I think that the field uh, has taken a little bit of a different direction um, because they are quite hard to, to, to converge. But um, architecturally speaking, they are very, very interesting and, and they have plenty of things to, to learn from. Um, in the, the overall idea of, of a generative adversarial network is to learn to mimic something. Yeah. So. In, in, in a normal uh, GAN setting, we have a generator and discriminator. So <coughs> we have the, the whole architecture and, and we distinguish two parts within the architecture. Yeah. The, and then the generator and the discriminator, each of them has a loss associated with them. Um, and what is the idea? The idea is that the discriminator, the, the box in, in blue, uh, will receive uh, two, uh, uh, will receive a sample, something in a particular uh, format, and decide whether that sample is real or, or is fake. Yeah? And that system, this is a reasonable system, it's a normal classifier, and can be trained. Um, Given uh, training data, it can be trained using a normal discriminator loss. More interestingly is the generator. So if we have a working discriminator, we can then take random inputs and the generator will produce samples, images or, 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 or any output uh, data similar to, to the ones uh, from the, the real images, send them through the this discriminator and try to fool it into believing that these images are real. Uh, and for that, it uses a different loss, quite a different loss than the ones used to train the discriminator. Uh, in a way, it uses the opposite loss that the ones used to train the discriminator. So one way of thinking about this is that by feeding 
images, real images, and, 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 and copies to the discriminator, the discriminator is acquiring inside of it uh, enough information about what makes images or what makes uh, real images uh, real that then that information can be reverse engineered by the generator using uh, the generator loss. Mathematically speaking, this uh, can be seen as um, we have some sort of minimax game. Yes, we have uh, a formula that one network is trying to maximize what the other network is trying to minimize. And that uh, formula, what it says is when the data is real, then the discriminator should uh, produce a, a maximum value. And when the data is false, then the discriminator should uh, produce a, a very low value given the, the, a random number produced by the generator. Yeah? Uh, in practice, the, the system is not trained using this formula, but what we do is uh, um, we basically alternate between training the discriminator and training the generator. Yes, so we took many real and generated samples and, and trained an initial version of the discriminator. And then, with that working discriminator, with the random inputs, and use them to train the generator. And we go back and forth. Uh, so this is similar to the max expectation maximization algorithm as used in, in gaming, drug clustering, and, and other techniques. Uh, however, the, the problem is that uh, this uh, has a, it is very hard to, to make it uh, converge and, and to train because uh, unless the discriminator at the very beginning has um, enough information, there is not enough um, gradients left to, 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 to build the generator. Yes? So that's uh, a big problem with them. But one of the interesting things about this uh, system is that early on people realized that when you have this type of structure, you can start asking the generator to uh, also encode semantic information inside. And, and this is the idea of disentangled representation learning. So in 2016, um, Chen and other authors, uh, and co-authors, presented the infogans that have received about 4,000 citations um, that allow to make interpretable representation learning. Yeah. Um, and this uh, then allows you to tell apart different latent representations. So in uh, disentangled representation learning is similar to the original uh, GAN uh, network we just saw, but the generator receives two inputs. One is the random uh, vector Z, and the other is a vector C of latent uh, variables. And these latent variables, what we want is for them to, to change the behavior of the generator so that a, a value on these uh, latent values, uh, latent variable, uh, implies that there is a, a cluster of, of outputs. Yeah? So, we don't know what's the meaning of, of a particular value in a class in a latent variable, but we know that it influences the generator to the point that 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 particular value has a meaning. It's observable in terms of the type of things that the generator produces. So once we have a, a GAN train, we can go back and say, oh, this particular value of the latent variable will produce uh, this particular result. And uh, the way this is done is, is, is to understand that that um, uh, latent variable is, is enforcing a regularization on the generator, meaning of all the possible um, uh, models the generator can take, it's, it's forcing a subset of those models 
so that they behave in, in this way with respect to, to these uh, latent variables. And uh, in uh, numbers, this could be seen that um, we are trying to maximize the, uh, the information that we can gain about the output of the generator once we know the value of the latent variable. Yeah? So, in practice, instead of, of using this information theoretical um, regularization, what we do is to say, well, if it is observable that the output of the generator behaves in a certain way, then um, a neural network should be able to realize. You should be able to observe it. <coughs> so, we uh, train a separate network, a recognized network Q, so that we can recover this value of C. And that's what we see here in the figure. We have the generator produces an output, and that output is used in the discriminator and in regular generic adversarial networks. But also, the output of the generator goes through the uh, discriminator, through the um, recognizer Q, to um, try to recover the value of C. So if the value of C can be recovered, then we can say without uh, any doubt that um, the generator is incorporating this latent uh, uh, variable in its output. And um, how do we train this? Well, we turn to multitask learning. As you can see here, for training G, this is a multitask setting. And in practice, what this means is that uh, one of, for example, first generating phases of people, uh, the latent variable might be the color of the hair. And we realize that when this particular latent variable takes the value 5, the people, uh, the faces generated are all red hair uh, people. So this is the, the type of things that um, the system works. And um, then there is the issue about how these uh, latent variables are encoded and how they are recovered and what type of loss function we use in the recognizer network. That all depends on, on the type of um, information we are trying to model. So if we have this entangled representation learning in natural language processing, then we can do um, uh, style transfer. Um, not using uh, GANs, uh, because GANs in, in NLP are, are quite problematic, but using uh, autoencoders, uh, encoder decoder frameworks. So in the next uh, lecture, we're going to see autoencoders, and I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the uh, disentangled representation learning is, is useful for, for style transfer. But uh, to uh, wrap up uh, today's uh, lecture, Let's discuss a, a little bit about uh, <clears throat> regular uh, neural style transfer. So neural style transfer, uh, it's, it's, it's a really popular topic uh, to the point that uh, these days it has been uh, completely internalized in society that this is the type of things that uh, computers can do and uh, now it's uh, it's very, very common to, um, to see this type of images. Um, from the perspective of, of neural network architectures, it's, uh, it's just uh, a very interesting example about all the things you can do with once you have a very clear understanding of what your neural network architecture is doing. Yes, because uh, for achieving the neural style transfer for images, um, in, in Gatti's uh, paper, they, uh, they actually take a train network and they don't modify the weights and all they do is, is modify the task and, and the loss function. So let's take a look a little bit about what is the, the actual uh, problem they are trying to solve. The uh, problem they are trying to solve is to say you are familiar with this type of, 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 of images, 
I'm going to take the image of the Mona Lisa and I want it to have the same style as uh, uh, Starry Night from, uh, Starry Night from uh, Van Gogh. Yeah? So, as you, therefore, the input for, for this algorithm is, is two images. Yeah? Uh, well, so the input is two images plus a, a, a general large-scale uh, neural network that produce uh, that has feature extraction for, from regular images. So that network uh, is, is a CNN-based network. We're going to discuss it in, in lecture uh, five. But at, at this stage, what is important to us is that this network processes e images in stages, and uh, because of, of it's a very well studied network and people really understand uh, how it behaves. Uh, there is this understanding that at different layers of uh, the network, there is different representations on different issues that are being featurized. And uh, what they realize is that at the very, very high um, uh, levels of, of the network, after a lot of processing, you end up with something that uh, encodes the content of the image very well. But at the lower levels of the network, the, the issues uh, that are being featurized, um, the representations that are being produced there, uh, have to do more with things like style. Uh, therefore, if we have a, an image and we want to copy the style of the image, in this, uh, we can look at the activation pattern uh, in the uh, lower levels to say, okay, if my activation patterns are similar to these uh, activation patterns, then it must be um, an image of, of similar style. And to capture whether the activation patterns are similar or not, we use the, the gram matrix uh, of, of, of correlations between the activation uh, uh, patterns we are seeing in, in, in one image and the ones we are seeing in the other. In the same way, if we believe that uh, at the higher levels that we have the content, we can feed the content image random through the network and compute the correlations then against the activation patterns in, in a higher uh, layer. With this, we have uh, two matrices, uh, metrics. One that says the, uh, how is the grand matrix. Uh, of correlations happens with the content and how it happens with the style. We can use a convex um, uh, combination of them, use weights alpha and beta such that they, they uh, sum up to one to combine them. And that gives us a loss function. Uh, now here, the interesting thing is that with this loss function, we can find, we can use uh, stochastic gradient descent, not now to change the weight of the uh, neural net, they are fixed, but to change the bits of, of the image, of an input image, such that they uh, minimize uh, these, uh, these distances, so that these are random images, uh, around the start. we start from a random image and then we start modifying it so that um, it produces an activation pattern in the style layer that is highly correlated with uh, our style image and a content layer, uh, content layer activation that is highly correlated with the content image. And that way we produce uh, this type of uh, outputs. Um, well, this is uh, the type of things uh, you can achieve uh, with a very clear understanding of what the neural architecture uh, is capturing at the different layers. And um, now to wrap up, uh, been using CMS Network for a while now. They're very successful. Um, I learned about them in a hackathon I did a number of years ago in, in um, Google uh, San Francisco for um, uh, a nonprofit called Learning Equality. Uh, we were doing curriculum matching. So they just come up with a Kaggle competition on that. So if uh, you are interested on, on trying uh, CME's network, so please check it out. That Kaggle looks very nice. Uh, and now I'm using it for um, uh, an open source project where I'm experimenting with a few things. One of them is to use um, Afro GPL to protect annotations. Yes, yeah, so to consider data as code and models of objects. 
Uh, and the intention here is to do recommendations in the browser using a metric trend with a Siamese. And I'm actively looking for collaborators for these, people willing to uh, share notation preferences, help a JavaScript front-end, etc. So if you're interested, come to telanshow.org. And uh, while uh, guns are uh, very exciting, uh, they don't work if the generator is not differentiable uh, because you cannot use pro back propagation. Uh, that limits their usefulness for uh, natural language because language is not differentiable. But we can replace the generator with a component that can be learned using reinforcement learning. And uh, that uh, interesting concept uh, was discussed in a New uh, 2019 tutorial I attended called Invitation Learning as its Application to Natural Language Generation. Uh, it's available to watch online, so I highly recommend it if uh, language is something you are interested in. And uh, that's all what I have for today, but I'm um, really looking forward to discussing with you and uh, seeing what you have in mind for, for the seminar. Thank you very much.